Welcome to Syntax, a Generative Introduction, 4th Edition. My name is Andrew Carney. I'm a professor of linguistics at the University of Arizona. I'm the author of your textbook, and I'll be leading you through this series of video tutorials. In the last unit, we talked about how we're going to store our hypotheses in the terms of rules and grammars. But what we haven't yet talked about is how do we go about gathering the data we need in order to figure out what those rules and grammars might look like. There are some obvious sources of data that syntacticians can use. They can use collections of spoken and written data. These are called corpora. Corpora uh, can come from a variety of places. There are uh, telephone recordings. There are collections of recorded real-world speech made by linguists. There are newspapers, books, and magazines. There are folk tales that might have been recorded by a field linguist. And of course, there's the web as well. Corpora of data can be incredible sources. They tell us so much both about the culture and about the language. I've got an example coming up. It's a recording of my colleague and native speaker of Scottish Gaelic, Muriel Fisher, talking about how when she was a child, they used to dry out the bricks of peat that they would use to heat their houses. Peat is compressed moorland that's made out of old dead plant life. And after centuries and centuries of compression, it can be dried out and burnt like logs. Nishja, when we pray me on the mono, I guess had Hanatunia on the hill, I guess had the Chirikura V. Gupper at a vonu, I guess, um, must the house yet at an upper show, va a vonu uluna ve at a near on the hill, ach hiramich a mulochechke, so nursen, ha achke di chunda, Nishja shock a ma fluker and da hu femimira, ach on the hill. And the hill, as, as a fat as show, she a crap once a grot a cat as show, a had hoof show chirim. I guess Nisha, she wish Nichiana was Jewish doch a tree shakin and just show you poin, wish in Chinamacher of Anu. I guess Vermichaka could at a has vek no at a has chrome. I guess Nisha shall ho has a fluch hammer crow. I guess Nisha chun put Kurishin and doof chirim a stay. As I say, corpora can be really excellent sources of data because they can provide us with uh, both culturally and contextually situated sentences and may reveal structures that we wouldn't have otherwise known existed. But there are downsides to using corpora as well. Take, for example, um, the following uh, intuitions about the meaning of sentences. So let's take the sentence, where do you think she dances? Now this is actually ambiguous. It can mean two things. You could be asking about where she did her dancing, or you could be asking about where you did your thinking. One question linguists ask is why are ambiguities like this even possible? But it gets even more uh, crazy and complicated. Consider this different sentence. Where do you wonder if she dances? Now this sentence isn't ambiguous at all. It can only mean where the wondering happened. It can't mean where you think she danced. Now, if you were to look at a corpus of data, could you determine that there was a difference in ambiguity between the sentence, where do you think she dances, and where do you wonder if she dances? There's no way from a, from a corpus that you can actually get that distinction. Worse yet, consider a sentence like, who do you think that ate the honey soup? That's not a sentence of English at all. But we're not sure why, unless we can ask the question, what is a sentence that you can't say? One of the key things to doing scientific experiments is to be able to determine whether your hypothesis is falsifiable or not. In order to look at whether or not a hypothesis is correct, we also have to be able to look for the data to prove it wrong. 
If there's evidence that the hypothesis is wrong, then the hypothesis must be revised. This is called falsifiability. Now, if you think carefully about corpora, it's not clear that they contain the data you need in order to falsify your hypotheses. Sometimes they do, but sometimes they don't. And the reason that they often don't is they don't include unacceptable sentences. Or if they do contain unacceptable, unacceptable sentences, they're not necessarily the ones you need to disprove your hypothesis. You can get that data a different way. You can get that data by accessing speaker's mental knowledge. This is something we call an acceptability judgment. It's a well-established scientific methodology for exploring language. The acceptability judgments are sometimes called intu intuitions, which is a bit of a misnomer. They're not about intuitions. They're actually about whether or not the speaker can judge the sentence to be acceptable or not. There are two kinds of acceptability judgments. One kind, which we call syntactic judgments, concern the form of the sentence. So for example, we know that peanuts the my eats not cat is not a grammatical sentence of English, the words are in the wrong order, the shape of the sentence is wrong. Another kind of judgment are semantic judgments. We already saw an example of uh, ambiguity judgments. Those are semantic judgments. Another kind are where the meaning of a sentence is odd. So for example, my toothbrush is pregnant. Seems very odd sentence to say. We're going to appeal to both kinds of judgments as we do our work in this course. It's worth noting that corpora and judgments tap very different sources of information. Corpora reflect our performance, that is, what we actually say and what we actually hear. They are reflecting something that we might call an e-language or external language. Their language as we observe it in the world. By contrast, uh, judgments tap something very different. They tap what we call our competence. Now, competence here has a different meaning than it does in other disciplines. But competence here refers to your internal knowledge about something. So when you tap your judgments, what you're doing is looking at your competence of the language. The focus of generative grammar is competence. And we describe the thing that we're looking at as an I language or internal language. So what we're interested in is what we have in our brains and in our minds that allow us to speak and understand language. But it's an entirely internal structure. So judgments tap I language and refer to competence, whereas corpora tap E language and refer to a person's performance. There's one more topic I want to cover before we leave this video, which is how we use data to evaluate how good our hypotheses are. In 1965, Chomsky, in his book Aspects of the Theory of Syntax, proposed that there were three levels of grammars. The most minimal kind of grammar is one that only evaluates how well the hypothesis does with respect to corpora or other performance data. We call these observationally adequate grammars. The next level up, slightly better, are descriptively adequate grammars. Now these account for all the data plus acceptability judgments or competence. The final and best level of grammar that Chomsky identified were called explanatorily adequate grammars. Now explanatorily adequate grammars not only account for corpus data or performance data, and as well as judgment data, but they also account for how we got the system. So in other words, do they explain how we acquired the system, how we learned the system, how the system developed evolutionarily? So to summarize this video, we looked at what kinds of data we can use to test our hypotheses. We talked about corpora, which are excellent sources, but we also saw that they had some shortcomings. So we also need to turn to acceptability judgments. 
Acceptability judgments come in two forms, syntactic acceptability judgments and semantic ones. We noted that the two different kinds of data sources we've talked about, corpora on one hand and uh, judgments on the other, really tap at two different kinds of information. Corpora and other kinds of recordings and collections of data reflect our performance or what we actually produce, whereas syntactic and semantic acceptability judgments tap our competence or what we know about a language. We then finally concluded with a quick discussion of how we might evaluate our hypotheses with respect to the data that they cover. So observationally adequate uh, grammars cover corpus or performance data. Descriptively adequate grammars include both corpus and performance data and acceptability judgments. And explanatorily adequate uh, grammars take that one step further and try to explain how we got the system that we have.